When I got to ATL, it was 93. Mm -hmm. I went to the uh, Freak Nick. April, oh. 90, April 93. I heard about the Freak Nick. I moved to Atlanta because of Freak Nick. Freak Nick 93 was life changing. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle paid the price. Want a slice, got the roll of dice, that's why. All my life, I been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle paid the price. Want a slice, got the roll of dice, that's why. All my life, I been grinding all my life. Hello, welcome to another edition of Club Shay Shay. I am your host, Shannon Sharp, also the proprietor of Club Shay Shay. The guy that's stopping by for conversation and a drink today really needs no introduction. He's hip-hop royalty and a rap legend, gold and platinum selling rapper and songwriter, record producer and executive with almost 40 years in the game. The king of the bay, too short. What it do? What's up, man? That's a multi Platinum. Multi. <laughs> multi. Multi. Yeah, because I did it, I did it like seven times in a row. What? Oh yeah. Well, talk to us about it. I'm just trying to figure. You got a new you got a new single coming out called Nasty Dance. Mm -hmm. You always seem to have an album coming out. <laughs> what number album is this for you? I lost count, but it's uh it's up to like 20 something, like 21. So 20 somewhere up there. So you got this, tell us about the single that you got that you're about to drop. Well, you know, I'm just trying out new platforms and stuff. I, I um, partnered up with a company called Encore. Okay. And it's just a new style of uh, how they shoot the videos and how they present it. And I'm just, you know, at this age and with my career accolades, I really don't have much to prove. Right. So, you know, you know, we formed the Mount Westmore group. That's me, Snoop, Cube, and E-40. Right. And that's kind of like my thing. So right. outside of that, I'm just freelancing a little bit, doing stuff. Right. Having fun. I love rap, so right. I'm just doing it. You started, you got 40 years in this game, so you started back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a lot different. What's some of the biggest differences that you noticed between rap when you started and currently where it is now? Probably the platforms is the biggest thing, the internet. Right. And that changed the game as far as, we were so worried about duplicating CDs and and copying MP3s and file sharing, right. and it just went straight to streaming. And right. So, and the streaming was streaming brought multiple pla multiple platforms. Right. And you can you can maximize just like an artist can get one hot song right now. Right. And you make a boatload of money. Right. Just by the fame you get and the different opportunities you can send your song. All, all these right. different platforms paying you. So it's it's a different ball game. And it's it used to be a lot about skills and what you can bring to the table original, now it's just about popularity. Like, right. the most popular guy is gonna get the money. So he, don't necessarily, he or she doesn't necessarily have to be good, but just have a hot song. And a hustle. And a hustle. And a hustle. So with the new platform that's out, you have the streaming, you have the internet, you have social media, guys, you can go directly. Mm -hmm. So do you really need a record company? Do you really need an... You need a record company. The majors have the airwaves on lock. Right. They got, you know, the big numbers on lock. Right. Yeah, worldwide, that international, it's on lock. Right. But you can get in there right. without a major, and you could be like a young Dolph, rest in peace, young Dolph, right. who was making millions independent. It's still, it's still a lane to right. get in there and master these platforms and make, make room for yourself right. without a major label. Yeah, I, I recommend that as much as possible. Right. It depends on who you are individually and what you want out of this. Right. But there is a way to have ownership and run your own show and right. have your own team and be ma and be a major artist. Right. But if you just like you like, I want to be that guy. I need to be Drake. You're gonna need that big. You're gonna need you you gonna need that you're gonna need a machine behind. You. Exactly. Well, you know what? Let's toast. I have my okay. own brand of cognac. You've been 40 years deep in the game. Yes, sir. You did it your way, and you're still continuing to do it your way. Salute, bro. Here we go. That's my own brand. Tell me it ain't smooth. Go ahead and talk to me, show. No, it, it really is good. I, would, I wouldn't even lie to you either. It's it's because if you could just drink it and it's not a problem. Right. It's smooth. Like, I don't, this cognac, man, this remind me of, of the, the, old, the, the 90s. <laughs> Tell the story. We was telling off fair. Say, you know what? I used to be a big cognac drinker. Oh, yeah. I don't really drink as much as I once. I don't really partake in the cognac as much as I once did because it reminds me of the days before I really made it big. Mm -hmm. And I was just a little guy, you know, hanging in the streets with the homies and we get the bottle and pass it around. 
on a cold day. <laughs> you know, cognac was your jacket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a hot day, cognac was your air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm from that, and then I started getting a little money going into some different little places, and I'm like, you know what? Well, let me get a margarita. Yeah, so you got food for you. You got brand new owners. So I, that's all, you know, I just, I just switched it up a little bit. And then when I when I sip a little bit, as soon as I sip it, the smell of the seed, I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm back on the street corner in Oakland. <laughs> in my mind, you know, I'm, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a tequila guy, but at the same time, I have a great cognac drink that I've, I've made many people over the years mm -hmm. that it's high calorie, but it's the bomb. So you, you take, um, you take an even shot of the cognac, the Kahlua, mm -hmm. and the Bailey's Irish Cream. Right. Even, they gotta be even shots. Okay. Put them on a lot of ice and let it just all get together. Right. Stir it up real good. It's like a, uh, it's like a separator, but with a ghetto twist. Right. And then um, the other version is replace the ice with ice cream. So a couple scoops of ice cream, mm -hmm. one shot of Hennessy. Well, not Hennessy, we want the Shay Shay. We want the Shay Shay, yeah. One shot the of the Shay. yeah. One shot of the uh, Kahlua and one shot of the Bailey's Irish Cream. Mix it with the ice cream and let it, let it turn into a milkshake. I'm trying to tell you. Well, we're going to try that. I'm telling you, it's called a, um, a Dirty MF. Okay. And uh, people such as uh, Allen Iverson used to like it once upon a time. Right. It was, it was, I turned on, I turned Scarface the rapper on to it. Right. And between me and him, we turned a lot of people on to the, right. the Dirty MFs. Okay. I like that. So what can we expect from this album, though? Uh, you can expect hip hop to expand, meaning that every time one of your legacy artists who have who has been around for a long time, right, and you know Nas still dropping albums, Jay Z right. still dropping hits, right. you know rappers who are well into their forties are doing good, right, and some into their fifties, you know, right. Snoop Snoop Dogg just right. hit fifty, and it's like we're just expanding hip hop. Hip hop hasn't had uh, fifty year old rappers, correct that have any type of success. If I had told you in your 20s, in your early 20s, that you'd still be doing this in your 50s, what would you have said? I would have said you're crazy, because I was like, <laughs> at my early 20s, I would have said, anybody that's 32 is an old man. Right. <laughs> you, you calling me an old man rapper? And the young rappers right now see it the same way. They like, right. man, you old dudes. And I'm like, dude, you're going to be an old dude one day. Yeah. And you you're going to wish, you're going to wish, if you're a 22-year-old rapper, you're going to wish that you could be a, 42-year-old rapper on stage, and they love you. Right. Because that's hard to do. You know what? My grandpa used to say, hey, I've been your age. You've never been mine. Yeah, E-40. Keep living. E-40 just said that in the rap. <laughs> I <laughs> just said that. You keep, you keep living. So, yeah, man, you know, um, I just think uh, it's a beautiful thing to, to do what you, do what I'm doing right. in my 50s right. that I did when I was a teenager, and it's still something I love, and it's still getting me money. Right. Is that why you do it? Because you still love it? You don't have to do it. Obviously, I, you made money. You're still making money. But I do it because um, once upon a time, I announced that I was retiring. Right. I was 30 years old. Correct. And it was a big promotional push behind Too Short Retiring. I was right. on my 10th album at the time. Right. And I remember DJ Red Alert mm -hmm. said to me, um, he was like, you don't ever see jazz musicians retiring or blues, you know what I'm saying? Right. They keep performing. You know, yeah. Diana Ross and Smokey and them, they on the stage. Stevie like, Wonder still performing. Why does a rapper have to stop? So when he right. said that, I never ever considered retirement ever again. Right. And I think that the more I get older and wiser, I'm like, somebody's got to keep doing this. Dr. Dre is older than me. Right. And he's about to perform at the Super Bowl. It's going to be lit. Rapping. Too. It gonna be lit too. They didn't go get uh, Young Thug and Gunner. They didn't go get <laughs> you know Money Bag Yo. They they got Dr. Dre. Well, if you're in L.A., I mean, you got to. How you come to L.A. and don't get Dre? How you don't get Snoop? You you. I mean, you but, can't. But ageism is a real thing in in entertainment. It is. And they got Dr. Dre. <laughs> so I, that's like that. That is the whole narrative of what I'm trying to be a part of. Right. Is every time. Jay Z steps up to the plate, we accept it. Right. And ever since he was twenty something. Right. You know, so it's like, this is saying not for me. Look what I did. This is saying for my young homie. Look what I can do. Right. Look what is Tom Brady doing right now for quarterbacks. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? He's saying it can be done. Right. I don't know if you can do it. 
who are some of the features you have on this album? Uh, features, I'm trying to think right now because you know I really don't. <laughs> you don't? I, I really don't like value that that much. Right. So if I got like like say G Easy was on there, in my mind it's just the homie G Easy. It's like right. it's like nothing I can really like brag on it. Right. But I, I definitely have some features. I always go out there and get some homies. I just I do so many projects. Right. But, you know, like Mount Westmore. Like I'm not really focused on the, the bragging part of it. Right. When it comes out, you're gonna see. How do you determine who you hop on a track with? Obviously, if Snoop come, mm -hmm. you gone. Uh, Forty Water, you gone. It's based. You... On, it's based on friendships, relationships. Uh, I could have a relationship with the label or somebody at the label and not the artist, and they call me and say, "Hey, I need one. Need you to do one. I do it." I got a call from Jazzy Faye last night about an artist. They were, he's working with in Atlanta. And they sent me the song. I don't know the artist, but I'm gonna do the song because it's a Jazzy Fate production. Right. The beat is hot. So a lot of times it could be, is the song hot? Right. A lot of times it could be, who's the artist? Right. And it's an artist I don't know. I might check the numbers and go, oh, little homie doing it. Right. I'm gonna get down. So, and it could be family. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I, all my cousins get one favor. <laughs> And after that, you gotta pay for it. <laughs> like, cuz you want your favor to do be a show? You want me to show up at, <laughs> at your party? You need help with a car? Right. You get one favor. Right. In a lifetime. When I look at what some of the guys that you've been up with, mm -hmm. Tupac, Biggie, Jay Z, best Wayne, of the best. I mean, yeah. I mean, Dre, T.I. I'm the big homie though. Cause you, you while you bored job, you been at it the longest. I'm the big homie. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of people get at me and they ask me these stats and these numbers and this. What was happening in there? I was like, all these stories you telling, I'm, I'm, in it. I'm the big homie. And in these stories, in these situations, you talk right. about Big, Pac, name all these people. I was platinum when these dudes was in high school and middle school and stuff. I was right. out there living and kicking it. So when they came to the party, I was already the big dog at the party. Like, right. you know, Snoop Dogg was in middle school bumping too short. They all, I'm the OG, man. So, you know, these this list of artists I've collaborated with a right. lot of times, a lot of times, majority of the time they were getting at me. Right. And they're like, I need too short on the song. I brought a whole lot with me. Right. And you know I'm proud of it, but at the same time, when you look back on it, you look like all of us were right there. But nah, when Jay Z first got at me, no, you way over. I had way more platinums than I was established. Yeah. All this, so it's it's cool, man. I I love where it all the way it all played out. I love that when I look back at it, you know, I'm a part of an elite group. Right. And and you know, and it's history. It's it's hip hop history. I mean, it's it's, it's I mean, when you think about it, think about when you started. Mm -hmm. I was lit. Look at where we are now. I'm still on the scene. Mm -hmm. it, like you said, you just mentioned Tom Brady. Tom Brady said, "Look, bro, I'm I'm three generations, bro. I did it 2000, I did it 2010, here I'm in 2020, still doing work." He's playing against quarterbacks that wasn't born when yes, he got to the league. For sure. <laughs> That was two years old when he got to the league. Did, did you think you would have this kind of success, this kind of staying power when you started? So when you're a legend and you're breaking records and you're blazing trails, you don't care about that or even know that. Right. Because you're a trailblazer. That means right. you're in front. Right. And you, you, you're the one burning the trail. Right. You don't realize it till it's a paved road and you look back and go, oh, I, I started that. I did that. So I'm, I'm saying you in that status right. of, of of just like you're doing greatness. Right. You can't think I'm doing greatness while right. you're doing greatness. You're like just trying to outdo the men in the room with you. Right. And it, and we, and you like um. You know, we talk this stuff about uh sports eras. Right. Who would have been who in what era? Right. And I'm like, a, a grown man is a grown man. Size, strength, speed. You put that grown man in any put him back in Africa 500 years ago. He gonna be a man amongst men, right? Because that's who he is, right? And I think you, you know, you drop me off in any era. You drop me off in this era of hip hop. I'm gonna shine. And I just feel that confident about who I am as an individual. Drop me off in the hood in Baltimore, Maryland. Right. I'm gonna get home. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everybody ain't gonna make it home, but I'm right. gonna make it home. Your style. How did you come up with the way you were gonna rap? I was uh, mimicking. New York rappers, it's early 80s. Okay. And when I say mimicking New York rappers, I just mean party rap, you know, you know, the girl in the blue dress, well, you know, you know, just just it was like a shout-out thing and a fun thing. And you just right. kind of rhyming little simple words and 
and just trying to get your cadence and your patterns together. Right. And then I heard The Message. And The Message is one of those songs that came out in 1982. I was in 11th grade. I was one of them little kids that had the beat box, mm -hmm. my big boom box. And I'm walking down the street, bumping out. This day, I always remember this day because I was by myself and had no car. Probably was walking from somewhere to the bus stop or something coming from the bus or something and a song came on. I right. stopped in my tracks by myself on the, I, was, I wasn't even on the main street, I was in like a neighborhood and the song come on and I'm like, I put the radio up to my ears. He's like, broken glass everywhere. I'm like, what? And I'm, I'm in the streets of Oakland. I'm a rapper, I'm pretty popular. I'm like little baby popular. Right. And I think to myself, oh my God, I gotta start rapping about Oakland. Right. And literally at that moment, that's what it turned into. Right. And everything from that point on has been like, um, it's just been like a match made in heaven. Like when, when I put the pen to the paper, I just think about Oakland. Right. And I write songs and it's just, it's, the message gave me that. Yeah, but you write about Oakland. Obviously Oakland is in you, but you were able to branch out because it wasn't just the Bay rappers that were one to, uh, too short on the hook. So, it was... so I spent my early years right. born in LA. Right. And I moved to Oakland right after ninth grade. Okay. So I'm of that age where if I was in LA, probably could have been trying to dip and dodge and right. avoid gangs. Right. If I get to Oakland and it's a different thing, it's not the street gangs, blue and red, it's not like that. It's, to me, Oakland looked like a movie. Right. It looked like a black exploitation movie that came to life. Like I'm on set in the movie. Everything was colorful. It was the cars. It was the lifestyle. It just, I'm looking at it. It, it was totally different in LA. Right. And it just, you know, it just really like, I think that me telling the story of my experiences and what Oakland taught me and brought to me right. was partially uh, because of my outside influences. Right. I spent every summer of my childhood in New Orleans. Right. Okay. My mother couldn't wait till May, June. Yeah, school was out, you got like, to go. <laughs> yeah, me and my brother, you on the plane. Like, come back, I'll see you in August. Right. Like, you don't get rid of us for two months every summer? <laughs> yeah, y'all, go stay with my sister. Go stay with my mama. And I think that that music in New Orleans right. gave me a whole different cultural thing that West Coast rappers didn't have. My Knowing and the streets of LA and coming up and being around the blue and the red and the, and, and the hood stuff out here and the right. music influence out here. When I get to Oakland, I bring all this with me, like subconsciously. And then I absorb all this Bay stuff in the Bay Area. The Bay Area music is Sly and the Family Stone, you know, right. the, the Whispers, the Point of Sisters, yep. Tower of Power. And this is before rap. Right. And, you know, Confunction. It's like the Bay has, has a, I can name a lot of groups. The Bay has a very rich music heritage. Even the gospel, the Hawkins family, you know, like it's a lot. And when I come up as a rapper, I'm the first rapper. I'm the first guy who steps up to the plate. And I'm looking at it like, cause people, you know, the people that were, I was working with when I first came up, some of them was, had been around Rick James. Okay. They had been around Tower of Power. They had been around Sly, Larry Graham. Right. And I'm like, Okay, I got to They telling me the story. You you taking me old. You taking me <laughs> way back. Larry Graham wanted a million convunction love train. Yeah, but man, <laughs> you know that love train. But I'm saying these OGs yes. are telling me, look, youngster. You know this is what we did. This is what we you know. Right. They telling me like, the greatness. And I'm like, oh, I got to live up to this. So right. from the start, it's quality, man. It's 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 got to be quality. And you go listen to the early two short songs, and I'm it's musicianship, man. It's, I got real like musicians on there trying to uphold the legacy, right. so, you know. How did you link with 40? Uh, me and E-40 have street ties. Okay. So E-40 is definitely a street guy yeah. from the streets. And my whole influence of how I came to be was from street guys. Like literally, I had a hustle where I sold cassette tapes in the streets mm -hmm. and 100% of our clientele, I had a rap partner named Freddie B. 100% of our clientele was street level drug dealers. Right. Who was on the street selling drugs. Right. And through that, through those relationships, when I started the label, the first thing I went to, I didn't go to Wells Fargo. 
I went to the street dudes right. to start the label. If you go back and check almost the entire hip hop industry, a lot of us got bankrolled by the streets. Right. And because well, you couldn't get a loan. Bank ain't give you the loan. So what's your occupation? Oh, I'm a uh, aspiring rapper. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> so E40 and his cousins and brother. Right. They some street dudes who financed themselves. They right. went and got the game from their Uncle Charles. Right. Who was affiliated with the music scene around Vallejo that could function around it. Mm -hmm. And I got the game from a guy named Dean Hodges, who was also a street dude, mm -hmm. who was dabbling with a lot. He, I feel like he wanted to be a rock star, but he really didn't, couldn't play guitar or the drums or sing. <laughs> so he surrounded himself by all these music making people. Right. And he learned a lot. He taught me how to run an independent label. He taught me how to make music in a studio and, and mix it down and put it out. And me and 40, was on the same trajectory. He's in Vallejo. I started rapping and getting popular before him. Mm -hmm. He's motivated by me, but he's like on a whole nother island 30 miles away and he's doing it on his own. He's like, I'm getting out there. And I think um, the way we connected was his immediate crew was literally doing street business with my immediate crew. Right. And at the same time, they mixing and mingling. We the rap guys, we in the same crew. And we keep meeting up, hanging out around the same, you know, crew, not really talking about music, right. or not even really connecting. Mm -hmm. Just around each other, what's up, you know? Right. I seen your tape, I seen your tape, whatever. Right. You know, it's cool, I know who you are. I know who you are, it's cool, respect. And then um, it started getting more and more popular. And he always tells the story that he flagged me down on the freeway. You know, how you flag somebody on the freeway? <laughs> we on the fit, doing 55, 65. Hey, man, we need to work together. You know, he like, I kind of big willied on him a little bit. Like, yeah, okay, and roll the window back. <laughs> okay. I don't, you know, I don't think it went like that. Was it the roll or was it the electric? You know, you can, you do. No, this, this was a roll down day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a roll down. You roll it down. Yeah. And, that was that. Right. We still the same. I know him. We still like family, but we not music. Back then, nobody, man, you don't ask me to use my producer and uh, me try to do a collab with somebody from some. We don't do that. Like, right. your crew, your crew. Love your public enemy. Love your beats, everything. But I don't want to use your producers. Right. You know what I mean? It was just, it was just like that. So uh, fast forward a little bit. We had a big event that we used to do. They still do in the Bay. It's called uh, Summer Jam. Right. It was, um, you know, the, where the radio station bring the 50 artists out and let everybody get 10, 15 minutes and, you know, the 30, 40,000 people in the crowd and it's just a big day. So I had done that a couple of times. And this particular year, it was 40's turn to be the, the headline. Mm -hmm. He's hot, he's about to, you know, big show. And I wasn't on the show that year. Some stuff had happened where I moved to Atlanta and a young group, called The Loonies, I got five on it, mm -hmm. had mentioned my name in a record. And they mentioned this one line that said, it was trying to say, insinuate that they were a part of some situation that, that came my way and they made me move to Atlanta, which right. is far from the truth. Right. Far from the truth. Right. And I was totally offended that this record, the line was, that's why the town got rid of short. And they was talking about some some gangster gangster shit whatever. Right. That's why the town got rid of short. And I'm like, what? Like we them guys in the streets. Me and my we're them guys. Right. And you can't get away with saying that. You can't say that. And you think everything and, okay. So I was being diplomatic because the loonies are literally connected. Right. I could tell you many layers of the story. Like the way they get in the game is through people that I influence. My guys, all this stuff, we family. Right. So I don't go the route of, man, let's just go get these dudes. I'm, I'm not even thinking like that. I'm like, we're going to do this the right way. Summer Jam is coming up. That's the show where everybody in the Bay is going to be in the crowd. Right. The Loonies is on the show, E-40 on the show. Everybody, we're going to step up in front of the crowd, me and the Loonies, and just say to the crowd, ain't no beef between us. You ain't got to explain the song. You ain't got to just step up there. If you say that in front of them, I'm cool. cool. So I come to the show. They tell me, um, you know, we can only give you four passes short, but they gave me them sticker, sticker passes. Right. I'm like, I tell my guys, we good to go. I got four stickers. So we go to the show, four guys go in. I send one guy out with four passes. Four more guys come in. 
When one guy goes out with four passes, four more guys come in. We do that shit all day. Right. So the loonies are on stage, and I'm telling the KMEL radio station people, let's do this thing I got in mind. Let's do it. Right. I'll hold up right here. Uh, let's go get this a person. Now the loonies are off stage. They all missed the opportunity. So now we got all this friction backstage. Uh, long story short, the, not, not the loonies, but their manager got roughed up a little bit. <laughs> Um, we went out in the crowd, watched the show. He was a little upset. And I guess the presence of us and the ex over-exaggeration of what, how we showed up and what we did uh, prompted them to end the show before E-40 could perform. Then they went to the scandal of, of uh, Monday morning. Right. They get on the radio and have a, a comedian, somebody funny, fake my voice and pretend like I called the radio station. And, I, and the dude was like, is this too short? Man, I don't, I don't care if your name was E100. You ain't getting no stage. If I'm like, you know, right. I'll run this thing. And E40 called me. He was, he had that, that, that sort of anger yeah. that was not like an angry voice, but you, he's like, hey man, was you on the radio this morning? <laughs> and I'm like, nah. He's like, so you wasn't, you sure you wasn't, you didn't call up there? I'm like, wasn't me. He's like, all right, hang up the phone. And then, However, circle back and start coming out about the call and this and that. And then E40 is the kind of guy he said, I talked to you and you said to me, man to man, it wasn't you. Did the investigation, wasn't me, it was somebody funny. And long story short, the radio station was trying to make us enemies. Right. They figured these big dudes, a little too short, Vallejo, E40 and them to click, you know, they're gonna beat too short up and too, you know, right. the, pro the program director was trying to, she was sending around fax machines, fax, faxes, and Emails like band too short. It was it was terrible. So E40, who I give all the credit to, was like, man, you know, we got to turn this negative into a positive. Mm -hmm. He really wanted to do that show. Right. They really tried to tell him it was all my fault, and you know, they, they we need to be enemies. But we had already had a friendship. Right. So we took all that and we made this song called Rapper's Ball, right. which went platinum. It was our first record we did together. We probably done dozens of songs together. We did dozens of songs since then, and. It was almost like he could have took that bait. Right. And just been like, he, if he would have said, yeah, okay, Pony, when I see you, then it would have just been no turning back. It just, but he's 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 a um he's a smart guy. Yes. And that was a great decision. Cause I probably, if she on the other foot, I don't know what my reaction would have been. Right. Or yours. It was a big day for him. Right. He had spent a lot of money out of his pocket to put this big show on. Right. And they shut it down and said, well, blame too short. And it was just, you know, I always look back at that and I'm like, a radio station tried to end my career, tried to pit me against my number one ally, and all that backfired. Cause we like, we, our music is from us to the streets. Right. And you're gonna put a commercial middleman in there and like, I'm gonna alter this and I could, I could end your career with a fax machine. No, you can't. So now that you mentioned that, mm -hmm. this transition. Is that what's happening? Because we see a lot of beefs. Mm -hmm. And maybe the beef is manufactured. Maybe it's real. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these, you know, you rap about the, the proximity of where you grew up. You talk about what you see, what you've experienced. And because you've experienced, doesn't make his experience any less or her experience any less. Is that what we're getting at? Because like you said, 40 could have went a totally different way. But he called you and stepped like a man. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, I'm going to do my due diligence. Uh, too Short said it wasn't him. I'm going to do my due diligence, get to the bottom of it, as opposed to just cap it off. Mm -hmm. And then ain't no turning back from that. Yeah, a lot of situations that we see happening now where we got injuries, loss of life, could have been handled by a phone call from man from one man to another man. Mm -hmm. And just, what was it? Because clickbait is playing a part. Uh, rappers are using the clickbait to get popular, it's the most, it's one of the easiest ways to get free publicity. Right. Is to pick a guy, you, you got to play the same position as you. Right. And you got, you. we didn't have social media to call. No, 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 no. So uh, the week before the game, you just start hitting him. You're sorry, you're weak, <laughs> hitting with the personal, you're right. your ex-girlfriend. Yeah. Now he was hot when he see you. Right. But this is a different kind of hot. They sitting there saying, you know, street stuff. Right. 
And then you got this whole ego thing. You got to live up to it. Right. And it's it's so bad, man, where, in, you know, social media and playing with these streets and this music, you, you, you like, you got albums out and videos and your face is popular, but you're going to send out a message on social media saying, I'm on such and such street, F you and your whole crew. And they pull up in five minutes and shoot you. You just told them where you was at. Like, right. it's really, it's really crazy to me because I know what my guys did when I was coming up. I didn't do what they did. Right. They protected me from that. Right. When they did what they did, they said, man, you probably want to go because something about to happen. And they would even tell somebody, man, get short up out of here. And things would happen. They would not say, come with us. We about to go do this. Right. Or come stand on the corner while we do this. They wouldn't say that. They would literally say, stay away from what we do because we need you to be you. Right. We can't get in places that you get into if we don't have you. Right. So you got a guy for that. We got a guy for this other stuff. Right. And I think that um, if a rapper is promoting beef in these days with the social media, you got a crew of 30, 40 people. There's only one popular face in your crew. Right. That's you. You. So your guys do this and that. Y'all done incited some stuff. And then you provoking it with your song. When they see y'all around the town, they only know one face. You. And that's why I think, personally, I think we losing a lot of rappers is because, you know, chop it off at the head, man. That's the bread and butter. When you, when you gun down the rapper, you just gun down five other employees' income. Right. You just gun down school kids' clothes. You know what I'm saying? Right. Christmas. Right. A birthday. A right. A dope birthday that was going to happen. You gun down it. And same thing with jail. When the rapper do so much dirt with his homies and he end up catching the case of going to jail, you locked up the income. <laughs> you feel me? So right. I think that we're not looking at the big picture. When I say we, I'm talking about us in the hip hop industry of the trinkle down, the economic trinkle down of What's these rappers fire, getting man. murdered and going to jail. Like you, like man, you got a rapper that's making fifty grand a month, a weekend, not a month. Right. A weekend, every weekend he go out and make fifty grand. That money go to the crew. We we share. We you know you my role manager. You know what I'm saying? Right. You my hype man. You my DJ. We 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 from nothing. Right. And all that stops while you go do six months, a year, three years in jail. All that stops. So I'm like, we ain't thinking about the big picture. You leave the Bay and you go to the A. I don't know if a lot of people knew this mm -hmm. that Atlanta's been your home for two decades. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, was, I stayed in Atlanta 15 years. Okay. I'm, I'm back on the West now. Okay. I'm, I came but you back. Been, so you was in, in the 90s, mid-90s? I'm from 93 to 2008. Okay. ATL. So, you know, your boy was there. That, that's, your boy was there. I'm telling so you. So you know all about 112. Come you on know now. about Diamonds and Pearls. I know. You know how to go on club. I know everything. Okay. okay. I know when it was Diamonds and Pearls, and 112 was at the other location. Yeah. Oh, and then 112 Next to the Kroger. And, one, yeah. Disco Kroger. Yeah, that's what, um, what David Justice and, not David Justice, but uh, uh, Andre Rise and the Left Eye was in there wilding out in, yeah. in the grocery store. Uh -huh. Atlanta Live. Yeah. Go down the stairs. Yeah. Uh, and then 112 moved to the old Diamonds of Pearl location. Chester Bridge. Yeah, thank you. So I, I know all that, man. <laughs> I, know, I know a lot. I know the, you know, the original Magic City. I, the original Belfort. I'm the guy. And Blue Flag. And Stroker. So you name all them spots. <laughs> I'm the guy. When the club closed, I'm in there hanging out. I'm going to put the tables, the chairs on the table. Right. I'm in the, I'm in the, uh, I'm down there with the house mom. Right. While all the girls is changing in their yeah. regular clothes. They don't let nobody down there. I'm right. down there kicking in. I got some wings. You been to the Claremont too, haven't you? Everywhere. Eat breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> See, people don't know about you. <laughs> I'm laughing. You laughing because you know what goes on at the Claremont. Come on. I, I know everything, but, um. Yeah, I can tell you a lot about that, that ATL. When I got to ATL, it was 93. Mm -hmm. I went to the uh, Freak Nick. April, oh. April 93. I heard about the Freak Nick. That Freak Nick happened in 91. It was a picnic. It happened in 92. Piedmont Park sold the whole park out. And they was like, man, this Freak Nick. I heard about it. Mm -hmm. So me and a whole bunch of people heard about it. Mm -hmm. And we, Freak Nick probably went from... 20,000 people to 400,000 in a year. Uh, yeah. I was there. I, 
I moved to Atlanta because of Freak Nick. That's, my, the, that's the, my story. <laughs> at the time, I was living in Savannah. I had went back, to, so I had went back, finished my back schooling. But I was living in Savannah in the off season, and I called my brother. And I kept hearing people talk about it. I said, "Well, I'm gonna go to the Freak. I'm gonna go to Freak Nick." <laughs> I called my brother, hey, bro. They got this thing called Freak Nick going off in Atlanta. He like went in it. I said, "Such and such." He's like, "Okay, I'll meet you there." Freak Nick '93 was life changing. It was a monster. It was life changing. We um we got wind of it, right? We took about probably like 15 dudes from Oakland, like some baller, little baller crew. Yeah. We went out there. We 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 checked into a little hotel. It was like a bunch of Detroit dudes, Miami, mm -hmm. some some uh some Cleveland dudes, and we kind of all clicked up. And our hotel was like a like a crew, and um Freak Nick '93. I went for the weekend. Now, mind you. I'm born April 28th. Freak Nick is my birthday. That's, oh. that's the weekend. So, <laughs> on my birthday is, is Freak Nick. I check in the hotel three nights. I check out probably like three weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my homies from Oakland had moved to Atlanta. And he was like, man, what you, about, what you gonna do? What you like, what you doing in life? I'm like, man, I'm about to get me a little crib in the town. Probably, probably spend about a half meal up on the hill or one of them little private roads or something. He was like, you gonna spend 500,000 in Oakland? He was like, let me show you what you get in Atlanta for 500. We rode around looking at houses. He showed me these big old houses for like 350. I'm like, what? So it was, it was planted. Yes. I, I went home, I get home, ain't nothing but drive-bys and shootings and violence. And I mean, seriously, man, at the time, friends of mine had split up into a street war. Right. So friends, we're in a small town. Oakland is 400,000 population. Right. We got a small crew of homies that are now enemies. Right. And it's really hard in that situation to determine what's coming your way. Right. Because who's, who's, who picked what side? I don't know. Who's, who's friends? Who's mad at me because I hang out with them? Right. Like, it, it was really weird. And I'm going to Atlanta, taking little trips. And I just was like, man, I'm about to buy me a house out here. I went to the Jack the Rapper, which is in August, mm -hmm. four or five months after Freak Nick. Uh -huh. I didn't tell nobody nothing. We had Jack the Rapper, it's Tupac, it's Snoop Dogg, it's people everywhere. It's, it's, it's not Freak Nick, but it's still a, it's still an ATL oh, yeah, vibe. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. I just got, I had a little rental car. I just drove over to Southwest Atlanta by myself and bought a house. And then went back to the convention like I didn't even do it. And by the end of the year, the house was ready. I moved out. And, the rest is history, you know? That's how it happened. Atlanta was a hick town, too. It was It, it was nothing like it was, because I got there. I went to Freak Nick like you. I went to Freak Nick the first time in 92, went back in 93. I called my agent. That was uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Start breaking down, waning down Sunday. I called my agent on uh, uh, Monday. I'm moving to Atlanta. <laughs> Send the guy up here. <laughs> He's like, OK, we got this kind of, you got this, this much money to get a house. I said, I don't care what Wasn't you Wasn't nobody say. in Atlanta at that time. It was Bobby Brown. <laughs> it was, um, I'm trying to think who was there that was, that was like really like kicking up some dust. I remember uh, my boy Eric Sermon got there kind of early. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, you had like, I think LA, I think Babyface. I'm saying LaFace was, yeah, yeah. That, that was the game. Yeah. But, but no, but like you said, Bobby Brown was really the only like celeb that and was I, there. Cause I, I got there and I watched a little bit and I seen Bobby Brown having so much fun. I was like, I'm about to do what he's doing because he's having too much fun. And that's when the club stayed open all night. I probably, the club stayed open till seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah. I, pro I probably, <laughs> I got there in, at the end of 93. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I had a platinum album in 89, 90, 90, 92, 93. I had four platinum albums when right. I got there. Right. I show up, I got my little car, I got like, 20 inch rims. They're like, what are those uh, flying saucers? What is, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know, I was like Michael Jackson. I was, <laughs> that's when you, uh, when you, you, somebody go, man, you from California. You know Michael Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> of course I know Mike. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, <laughs> man, I used to be at Magic City. I, I, I never really tell this story. I used to be at Magic City and I had, um, I had a, an endless supply of the really good California weed. And literally, people, like, you you want to tell some chick, uh, man, girl, I'm trying to kick with you. What I got to do? I was open that bag. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what is that? I'm like, that's bad. Well, Cali, baby, like, 
I, I, I was having so much fun in 93, but Atlanta, uh, the Atlanta that we know now, I was, I'm proud that I was there to see it born. Young Dallas Austin, young Jermaine Dupri, mm -hmm. young LaFace Records, uh, Outkast came out of all that. Yeah, um, you got Luda, you got the TIs now, you got... The Olympics came. Yeah, 96. And then they started building up Atlanta with the Olympic money. Yep. And when the Olympics left, Atlanta was a nice city. Yes. It was nice. And yes. from that point on, the music industry was establishing itself mm -hmm. and it turned into a whole new Atlanta. The Atlanta it is now, I'm, I just, it just make you proud when you go out there and you see the entrepreneurs and you see the dream, you see the fire in people trying right. to make it. Yes. Trying to make it. Like, yes. everybody ain't making it, but they be trying to make it. Right. And that's like, that to me is so important that you try because people have dreams and they sit around and they think of stuff, but they don't try it. You said something very interesting early. You said that you left the Bay because there's some things going on. Do you feel that rappers have to leave their hometown, have to leave where they grew up from in order to get away? Because Everybody's not happy. Too Short is what he became. They liked Too Short when Too Short was mm -hmm. same level. Mm -hmm. We drinking, we hanging out. He ain't got no more than I got. I ain't got no more than he got. Too Short, my dog. Hold on. Too Short got more than I got. Man, Too Short got three cars. Man, Too Short. Man, they bumping Too Short stuff. So, in my case, it was it was a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you're close to that, you probably should separate yourself from it because Anybody that's into that that's close to you shouldn't want you to be there. If you're a ball player, right. if you're an entertainer, whatever it is, help that person. They should insulate you, know, you let's from help that. Help people make it out when you right. see them, when you see they got a chance. Right. So um, um, I think that in certain situations, like I noticed long after I moved, long before I moved, that in the daytime, you shine a little bit. Come by and say hi, what's up? You know, but at night, it's somebody that saw you earlier that day that was like, F him. And they might see you at the gas station or the store and just act on that. So I used to have like my, my, um, you know, different uniforms. Yeah. My uniform for hanging out at night was be, I look at everybody else, I'm like, okay, put on some black jeans, put on a little black hoodie, maybe a little Raider hoodie or something. Right. And, uh, you know, don't put the fly. What you call it, something cool. Right. And just come out there and zip it up. You know what I'm saying? I literally then, then, don't you stand out. Literally, I went and bought me a 1973 Camaro. Got a I went and took it to the cheapest paint shop, got a cheap paint paint job where if the if the little green chip, it'll be blue underneath. Right. You know what I'm saying? And put some hubcaps on it. <laughs> and had my little music inside. I had a brand new engine. Right. <laughs> it was reliable. Right. But I would drive that at night, and when you pull up, cats just be like, oh, that's short. You know, you ain't really pulling up with five chains on and, and jumping out, acting like you the man, and it just irritates people a little bit, a show off. So what I'm saying is, in certain situations, you don't got to leave the hood. Just understand that you rubbing it in folks' face. Right. All that social media posts and saying you got way more than everybody else. Somebody don't like that, man. Right. And it might be somebody that normally wouldn't even be mad at you, but you making them mad. Right. And then you come around and you're showing off and you're jumping out and you ain't really sharing because it ain't your obligation to necessarily share. Right. So you're irritating somebody. You might get a jealous, a jealous reaction. So I think um, smart is the thing you do, man. You be smart. You be smart how you move. And if you got to move out, if you don't have that respect, from like guys who fight good and guys who are very violent, don't come around them right. after you make it and you know somebody been, you know, lightweight bully situation right. or it's a dude that, like it's, in the hood it's dudes like this. You got respect. All these dudes gonna respect you. Mm -hmm. But it's just one dude that none of them is gonna mess with if he go bad on you. Right. And oh man, Debo done went bad on you. <laughs> Everybody who will protect you, now they ain't protect you. Like man, tell him stop. No. Nah. Can't, that's Debo. Right. <laughs> so, you know? Right. So, it's all these situations that you got to navigate through. Debo might not be the guy who want a job. He don't want to be your bodyguard. Right. He don't want nothing from you. He just he just don't like you because you're a punk showing off. Right. And, he, and it's, you in it. Right. So, it, you got to be smart, man. Right. You were in the 90s, mm -hmm. in Atlanta in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Tupac 
was also in Atlanta. He was there. In the 90s. He was enjoying, he was an early, he was an early one that got yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you were also in the studio with Biggie. Mm -hmm. What was, what was it like? What was it, I mean, because I talked to Snoop and Snoop, what was, what was Pac really like? What was it like with it being around him in the studio? Um, you, you know that, you notice instantly that Biggie and Pac both, you notice instantly, like, these guys are not in the same universe as me. Right. Because the way they, the way that their method of recording is truly unbelievable. Biggie, no pen, no paper. Doesn't even seem like, you know, the, the one time I was around him when he wrote a classic rhyme, which was, uh, the world is filled. When the Remy's in my system, ain't no telling, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Classic. We were in the room and it was drink, it was smoking, it was girls, it was loud, it was storytelling, it was jokes. It was just a lot of distractions. So we working on this song. Puffy got the first verse. Carl Thomas is on the hook. Mm -hmm. The beat is already done. Carl Thomas and Puffy already on it. Puff is playing it, doing his dance thing. And it's, you know, it was Puff's, uh, I forget how his verse start, but, but um, he come in slick. Right. And Puff at the time wasn't really known for like raps. He hadn't done a lot on Biggie's first album. Right. This was the second album. Right. And he was proud. He was hitting the knob and like, look how I sound. Like he right. did it. He, he, he crafted his away from everybody. And it was however he did it, he did it. Right. So that's the first phase. So I'm in the room. I'm supposed to be doing my little 16 bars. And, but it's a lot of distractions. It's the girls. and right. drinking it. You drink it. Let me hit that. Well, you know. I need to and concentrate. Then, so Biggie right there, we laugh, we still, and he like, I'm ready. What you mean you're ready? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's he talking about? He's ready. And he go in there and he's like, he tell everybody, like, watch him do this in one take. And he go in there, he go, when the room is in my system, ain't no teller. And he stop. He go, hold on, hold on, hold on, take it back. He like, watch. And the next take, he wrapped that whole verse in one take. And he, you know, when you, it's, this is what I, I like about rap. It, whether it's on you or you put it on somebody else, he came out that booth and everybody was like, ooh. <laughs> so I'm sitting here, there's two verses on the song, the hook is there, the beat done, it ain't nothing but an open 16, and me. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> like, oh, man, it, it was, it was it's, that dudes like that put you in that situation. How he did that, with all that noise and him talking, and right. how did he put that in his head and memorize. You know, Jay-Z went on to develop that technique and right. then Lil Wayne said, I'm, I'm throwing down the pen. And now, based on Biggie, evolution and Notorious Big, right. ain't nobody trying to use pen and paper because it's sort of like, it's, it's like a right. straight jacket. It's, right. it's, it's limiting your, your freedom your of how you yeah. go. Right. So I found my way up out of it. I, 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 I boxed my way out of it. it was, you know, I love those situations. I, I learned that. When you get around somebody that's better than you mm -hmm. and you ain't got no choice, you get better. Right. <laughs> you have to. Right. And Tupac was a whole different beast because he actually would actually take a pen mm -hmm. and paper. And I don't know if you've seen any of his written stuff. Yeah. He writes really fast. Right. And it's really like, like it has emotion right. in the pen. And he, and I'm, the, one night I remember in particular, he came in and did something on my album, a song called This Is How We Do. And he came in there, he's like, hey man, we, we had already made the song. He's like, man, let me get on that song. I'm like, you Tupac, get on it. <laughs> and he's, he gets the pen, he gets the paper, and he starts writing. And I'm watching him, and he's writing a line, and he's writing. As fast as you can just keep writing, he just keeps writing. Like, when I write a rhyme, I rap it. Dang, I'm thinking. Right. You know, it take me about 30 minutes, could take me an hour and get like a cool 16 or something, you know? Right. This man wrote this verse in like five minutes as fast as he could write it. And I'm like, he had to know this beforehand or something. But when you find out, he'd been doing that everywhere. And he gets in there and he just says, the, his opening line was, I finger fucker with my diamonds. Like, you just thought of that? Like, you just, just come in here? And, and everybody said it, man. They're like, Tupac could have like two verses written by the time you like just starting your first couple lines. Right. And he in the booth dancing circles around you. Go listen to a lot of the songs he did with the, with the um, his crew. 
um, the, got me thrown off now with the with the uh, Gaddafi and all that. Right. And the outlaws. Thank you. Tupac do the first two verses and then they come on. And they said a lot of the songs he got with people, he's already on verse two before you can even start. And he just, he go in the booth and rapping so fast while you still writing. He's like, catch up. And I don't know how these guys come up with this. I don't know. I just think it's, I wouldn't even call it genius. I would just, I think that, think about people who die young. They seem to, and do great things. They seem to have an urgency that right. they got to hurry up and do this because right. they seem to know ain't a lot of time. Right. And in Tupac's case, he rapped about it multiple times. He rapped about dying yeah. young. Yes. Getting murdered. Like yeah. he, he's, People don't realize Tupac was, what, 25? 25. Biggie would have been 25, I, too. Yeah. And it's hard to accomplish that much at that age. And that's the thing what people don't realize. <laughs> they, you would think that Biggie and Tupac had 10, 15, 20-year careers. Like five. We take Tom Brady away at 25, he's not a legend. <laughs> we take Too Short away at 25, ain't no legend. Yeah. Like, he, I need time to get to this. Right. The, he didn't have a Jay-Z career. He didn't have an LL Cool J mm -hmm. or an Ice Cube or a Snoop Dogg. The longevity. But I honestly think that somewhere in there, you get, a, you get the insight. I've, I know people who weren't as popular as them that died young, and they did great things. Right. Great things. I'm like, how do you know to do this? Right. How you know you got to do this much? So, I think I, I think those guys were um, gifts gifts to hip hop. Right. Tupac brought Biggie brought that style to no pen and pad, a lot of cadences, a lot of stuff, you know, the big guy swag. But um, you know, Tupac, I think, man, if you look at him, how many rappers had tattoos, thug life on their stomach before Tupac? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? How many, how many people was trying to, little skinny niggas was trying to tat it all up? Yeah. And he was, you know, he was emulating gangbangers, you know, Crips and Bloods, but at the same time, that's the look of hip hop now. Right. Like, you can't really be a rapper. Like, I'm a rapper with no tattoos. I've been laughed at. <laughs> the girls be like, let me see your tattoos. I ain't got none. You ain't, how you ain't got no tattoos? I'm like, <laughs> I was before Tupac, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell the story about the road trip mm -hmm. from Miami to ATL to be on Jay Z's Big Pimpin'. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, not Big Pimpin'. No, yeah, it was Big, uh, it was Big Pimpin'. Yeah. Big, Big Pimpin'. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was the um, there's a whole thing with Pimp C, UGK. Yep. Pimp C and Bun B and the Big Pimpin' song, and I hear Bun talk about it. And I, I knew the story. I knew a little bit of it because um, the label, Jive Records, we we're all on the same label, was right. trying to get Pimp to do the song. Right. And <clears throat> I knew Pimp's opinion on the situation. And it was open and shut. If you don't, if you don't fool with Tupac, I don't fool with you. Right. No bending of the rules. Right. We're talking about a guy who never met Tupac. Right. He didn't even know him. And he's like, I ride with Pac to the end. So anybody who ever said this on Tupac, ever, Pimp C didn't like you. Just, just never would fool with you ever, ever, ever. So he put Jay-Z in the category of, I don't think Tupac liked him. Tupac wouldn't, you know, as Biggie homie or whatever. I ain't, right. I ain't fooling with him. But Bun B, the label, myself included, was trying to say, you know, Jay ain't like that, bro. Jay ain't Jay. You know, it's, it's a great opportunity. Right. It's Jay Z getting at you. Right. Do it. I ain't doing it. Uh, you know, all this stuff. So, whatever Bun and all them did, they talked them into it. The song got recorded. But Pimp still had an attitude about the <laughs> East West and the. Right. He from Port Arthur, Texas, but he mad <laughs> about how y'all feel about Tupac. Right. And Bun B will give you way more insight on Pimp's state of mind about this. But I was given the task of Pimp won't go to the video, the two-day video shoot. I think it really was a one-day video shoot. They was going to shoot it in Trinidad at Carnival. Right. And this fool got a song with Jay-Z, a video at Carnival in Trinidad, and he, I ain't going. Like, if Jay-Z would have <laughs> called me and said, do the song, when? <laughs> you know the video at Carnival, when? My flight, when? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Not C. C was hard-headed. So, I was given the task of, can you get him to come to the video? They're going to add another day and shoot in Miami. They got to get C. It's a big budget video. I think Hype Williams directed right. it. Mm -hmm. 
So, Pimp C had just bought a brand new Mercedes. He loved his new Mercedes. And I think I had just got this little Porsche. So I was like, we should. He knew about the video. Right. I wasn't like, I wasn't scamming him or nothing. Right. I was like, we should get the cars. We go down to the video shoot, you know what I'm saying? We get down there, stay a couple of weeks, get some house, blah, you know, whatever. Right. And I, I I made it a thing. And he thought he showed, you know, if I said it, because I was, I was just like he looked up to Tupac, he looked up to me. Right. And at in all situations, Pimp would be like throwing a fit. And they'd be like, man, go talk to your, your little brother. Man, go talk to him. Right. I, I'll go in there and be like, can't talk him down. But you could throw some logic in there. Be right. like, see. We came here to get the money, man. Them people out there want to see the show, man. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's man. These people, man, let's get the money to the show. This how we, this how we do it, bro. We get at them, deal with them later. And he'd be like, all right, if you, if you say so. <laughs> but, right. but before that, he was throwing stuff around like, if everybody, man, I don't get your money out. Of. <laughs> so, um, we took the road trip. We got him down there. He did his scene, and we kicked it. We stayed in Miami. We stayed in Miami for a, a few weeks and had a ball. Like we. We really did kick it. You love you love sports. You, I'm a sports fan. You you sports junkie. You love it all. Basketball, football, boxing, Bay Area, Bo Bay Area sports fan. Very biased. You biased. Very biased. So you Steph Curry above all. I'm Warriors. The Warriors. You the Warrior. You know I was Monte Ellis. <laughs> you was there before Steph and Clay and Draymond. You was what did they call themselves? That was the Matt Barnes, Stephen Jay. What did they what did they. The We Believe team. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We believe. We believe. We, we had Run TMC, you know? Yeah, yeah. But look at this, man. I'm I'm the we the Warriors, man. We really question the Monte trade. Monte Ellis. Like, you gonna trade Monte and who who gonna be our point? The little little, the little kid with the uh, with the with the weak ankles? Yeah. Hey, people was mad. And Steph, you know, I, I really think he was that little kid all the way up until he get got that goatee. When he got that goatee, when that goatee came, he came in. He grew up. He's like, y'all know, I, ain't. I remember the first time seeing Steph Curry. The Warriors was, they used to club. You know, the new Warriors don't really club. Right. They, they, they a little more refined and, and, you know, the Steve Kerr Warriors. But the old Warriors, Baron Davis and them, Stephen Jackson and them, them boys, they went to the Matt Barnes. They was in the club every night. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, who is that little boy with the Warriors? <laughs> that little, who's the little boy? He's like, oh, that's the backup point guard. I was like, he's like a little kid, man. He was a little kid. And he's Steph Curry now, so, you know, for real. So, short athletes, give me your, no, first of all, you say Biggie and Tupac, obviously. Mm -hmm. Give me your Mount Rushmore rappers. Dang, that's, that's a tough one, man. That's really a tough, tough, tough one. I'm from a different era than most hip hop fans. And, you know, with me, right out, you can't do nothing without Melly Mel. Like, okay. and a lot of people ain't gonna put him there, but he put the MC in it. He was the first one to me that just put the MC in it. Yep. Like in it, like on right. a on not on a New York scale, on a commercial national scale. Yeah. Yeah, he was it. This is a songwriter, rapper, right. hit maker. Grandmaster Flash, Furious Five, lead rapper Melly Mel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, that's just a tough question, man, because I'm biased on the West Coast. I'm biased. Okay, well, how about this? Give me your West Coast. Give me your Mount Rushmore West Coast. Well, we just made the Mount Westmore group. Which so that's is, it? Which is my guys. And then. So you, you got know, 40, you, Snoop, and, and Cube. And I got DJ Quick, and I got Warren nah, G. Nah, you ain't got before. You got four of my Rushmore. You ain't finna add no heads to my Rushmore. <laughs> but hey, of, of all time, man, you know, I would put I would put Melly Mel up there just because of his impact on hip hop. And I would put Jay-Z up there because I feel like Jay-Z, I don't know where Biggie and Jay-Z would have ended up right. as Brooklyn brothers. If they both had a long career, I don't right. know where they would have went, what Puffy would have did with Big, and what it would have evolved to. But I do know that Jay Z is an extension of Biggie, and I don't. I do know that he. I don't know this for a fact, but I do know that he took on everything Jay Z was gonna be, and everything Biggie was gonna be. And he said, "I'm wearing both these, both these fucking right. coats, and, and 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 hold it down for Brooklyn." Right. Um. So where he got to is definitely it. 
uh, rapper wise, you can't put Dr. Dre in it because he's not a, a a writing rapper. Right. He, but he's Dr. Dre, and he had the the best resume. He got the best branches on his tree of Eminem and Snoop Dogg and Fifty Cent, and mm -hmm. you know, I, he's a producer. Right. But rap wise, man, it's it's just too many. It's too many. It's too many to just go down the line and go, who's the goat? Because it's too many goats, man. I got my, my boy Scarface. I mean, he's, he's goat status on right. the, the songs he wrote. Like, Scarface, you're going to say, Scarface? But go back and listen to the words like he wrote. This. Like, the words he wrote, yeah. he's it's so poetic. Poetic. In his yeah, they're, well, they're different style. Because people don't give K KRS his mm -hmm. lyricists. KRS, people don't give KRS his due. But, K, but I'm old enough, you and I are yeah. both old enough to know who KRS one is. And Big Daddy Kane. Mm -hmm. Kumo, I mean, so it's, and Kumo did. He was a, yeah. you know, he was a guy for a while. Rock him. Rock him. He, he changed a lot of a lot of the way people rap. You right. Know what I'm saying? Every a lot of people brought a lot to the table, man. So it's hard to, it's hard to go there with me, man. I can't top five nothing. I'm not arguing no top five arguments. <laughs> I'm not agreeing with no top five that you got it. I'm not, it's just, it's just not. I can't even top 10 it. Not even top 10? I can't, man. Okay, it's... well, give me your Mount Rushmore basketball. <laughs> now nah, you can do that. Hoop, let's see. Uh, I'm definitely going to go with Magic okay. and Jordan. Okay, that's we'll put them on there. Okay. Um, I got to witness, and I've seen the I've seen the college clips, and I've seen a lot of the youngster. Um, uh, it's high, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, man. Okay, Lou Alcindor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's 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 savage. Yeah, because we picture his end of his career when he wasn't really going back on defense, but right. a lot led up to that. Yeah. To still hold, does he still hold that scoring title? He does. He has it for another year and a half till LeBron. Gonna LeBron, get, you know, yeah, yeah. You know LeBron gonna get that. It's coming. He got to. He got to. That's part of his, why you hanging around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, LeBron, I'm gonna give LeBron. They they talked the LeBron Steph Curry thing, but I'm like, I have a theory. You might dispute it. I know you big up LeBron a lot. Uh, I have a theory. What's that? That later on, they're going to introduce the technology of human hybrids, and they're going to let us know that LeBron was one of the first, <laughs> like he was partially a robot. 6'9", 250, could run, could jump, body like Carl Malone. And I always thought it when he was a youngster, because he was a grown man at 16. Right. Literally a grown man. Mm -hmm. And he held up. And he's still, like, coming down that lane. Power went I, 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 I pity the fool that take a charge from LeBron. <laughs> like, I, they get out the way. I, I literally see players like you watch. You watch the game a different yeah. way to me, but you jump out the way when he comes. Yeah, you ain't got no pads on. Why am I taking? <laughs> why am I taking an elbow to the chair? Why am I taking a knee to the chair? I see dudes take that charge and lay there like. This. Yeah, I. I <laughs> I'm like, he's a that. robot. Yeah, he's a robot. He done a lot of robot stuff in the game too. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you for stopping by. Wait, don't mean it yet. What's that? Because I need to know. Cause I thought you and your brother was twins for years. <laughs> Who the oldest? He is. He's the oldest. Okay. I'm three years younger. For real? Yeah. You get the twin stuff a lot? No. Well, no, not really. But no, people mistake me for him. They say, "Well, were you the one that played in Green Bay?" Mm -hmm. I mean, people know we're brothers, but they always you know I'm a, you know I'm a Raider now, so man, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've always been a Raider. You got to get you a new team, bro. You got to get you a new team. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to do nothing. We about to get us a quarterback. Every, everything AFC West, you know. Yeah. You know how we get down to AFC West. Oh, yeah. Well, ain't, no love, ain't no love lost between <laughs> nobody in that division. Yeah, so and where y'all from? Born in Chicago, raised in South Georgia. Okay. So down in Savannah Way. Yeah. See, I went to school in Savannah. I'm about 65 miles from Savannah. Okay, so there. I know everything geographically. Okay, yeah. So you, so you, not only where do you live, so you parked it, you all down there in the Macon, Savannah, the going down there, all that. Georgia, Columbus, all that. Yeah, okay, South. Yeah, I, I know it all. I know it all. Every, I know every little town in Mississippi, Louisiana, <laughs> Arkansas. I didn't hit the back roads. I didn't hit the Chitlin circuit. Bro, yeah. Appreciate you stopping by, short. Thank you, bro. Good stuff. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice.
hustle pay the price want a slice got to roll the dice that's why all my life i've been grinding all my life look all my life been grinding all my life sacrifice hustle pay the price want a slice got to roll the dice that's why all my life i've been grinding all my life.